It was about two months ago I met Aaron Pierce for the first time. Since then, we've learned that this is a man that has a message that is for us today. It's so relevant for the times that we're in, and he is on a mission to help those who have faith in Jesus share that faith with others in our community. The young adult world today is largely not following God, not interested in walking in the church. What can we do to go to them and in a very winsome way share the good news? Aaron has a message to inspire us in that way. He grew up in Amsterdam and has now taken the message that he learned and took to the streets of Amsterdam and other parts of the world here to North America, and we're privileged to start a movement. Today is a day of new beginnings, a day of a movement. I want you to give a great welcome today to Aaron Pierce as he comes to inspire us. I'm looking forward to the seminar we're going to have next Saturday to extend what we learned today. You won't want to miss that, 9 to 1. I'm going to be there in the house for that experience as well. But it begins right now. Give a great welcome to Aaron Pierce. Good morning. It's really good to be here. Uh, I am just thrilled at what God is doing and the partnership and collaboration that's happening uh, with Capital Christian Church. And it's just, it's very exciting times. I just want to give a quick uh, personal introduction. Uh, my name's Aaron. Uh, I am married. I have one wife and four children, which I figure is a good ratio. There they are. Yep. We live up in Minnesota. We're drowning in babies at the moment. Even though my wife isn't here right now, I just have to give her a shout out because we live a crazy missional life and she is strong and she holds our family together. And if it wasn't for that gift that she is, uh, there's no way we could do what we do. So I just always have to give her a shout, a shout out even if she's not here. So God has called me to lead this mission called Steiger International. And so our heart is to reach and disciple the global youth culture. Uh, today we're active in about 100, over 100 cities around the world, including right here in Sacramento, which we're super excited about. And our heart is to mobilize followers of Jesus to reach young people who would not walk into a church. And if you know, that's something that's more and more of an issue that we face in our worlds. And so Steiger, the name, refers to a location in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, where my parents started a Bible study to reach young people who would not walk into a church. And if you know anything about Amsterdam, most young people in Amsterdam have that view, right? They see these big, beautiful theater, uh, um, cathedrals, and they're dead and empty on Sunday. And that's their view of God, just a dead, empty tradition of the past, not relevant to my life. And so this is the context that my parents were serving in. It was in the early 80s, and they really had a heart to reach these people. And so my dad would take a small group of people, and they would go late at night, like 10 o'clock at night, till 5 in the morning, into the bars and into the nightclubs, and they would build friendships and relationships with people in that context. And they would get to know them, they'd get to know their hearts and their dreams and their doubts and fears, and then they would share Jesus with them. And then they wrote the names down of everyone they met, and they went out into the forest outside the city, and they prayed all night for these people, asking God to break through in their lives and for a breakthrough in this city. And then my dad was, was doing this for a couple years and feeling a sense of, Lord, we, we need more. We need, some, we need a breakthrough in this city and so he's, he was asking God for something, and, he's, and my dad is kind of an edgy, creative guy, and this was in the 80s in Amsterdam, and so the height of the social movement there was the punk rock scene, and that was like what was really influencing culture at the time, so he felt called by the Lord to start a band, to start a punk band as a tool to go into their environment and to use the stage to proclaim the gospel message. And very, from the very beginning, the idea was to lift up the message of the cross outside the church. Paul said that he preached Christ and him crucified so that people would not be convinced by human wisdom, but by God's power. And that's what people need, and the power of, the cro the power of God lies in the message of the cross. And so from the very beginning, they used the stage to lift up the message of the cross, and suddenly they saw many people come to know Jesus in that context. 
and they were a little bit overwhelmed by it, so they didn't know what to do. So what they did is they started a Bible study on a red boat right there in the top left corner in Amsterdam, right in the center of the city. And the address of this boat was Pier 14. And the Dutch word for pier is Steiger. So they literally named what became a church the physical address of this big red boat. And, and so it, this, boat, this, this church called Steiger 14 was reaching young people of the city of Amsterdam that normally would not walk into a church. And that was the environment that I got to grow up in. And eventually what happened is this band that my dad started started to go to other places. They went to communist Poland and the Soviet Union. And what happened is people in these places and other places, they were reached in very unlikely places. And Christians were inspired. And pretty soon people began to identify with this movement. And they would say, yeah, we're Steiger Poland or we're Steiger Russia. And they were referring to the church back in Amsterdam. And so it was never a strategic plan. It was a move of God. And, and I got to be part and experience that myself. I remember my dad would take me and my younger brother on tour. And we would go to like, we'd be in some nightclub in Eastern Europe, some tough, cynical nightclub. And at some point, he would bring me and my brother on stage. And he would say, these are my sons. I love them. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. Everything that I have is theirs. If someone tried to hurt them, I would protect them with my life. And then he would say, and that is how God feels about you. And he would equate a father's love for his children with God's love for them. And I saw tough people with tears in their eyes praying to receive Jesus in these environments. And when you experience something like that as a kid, it completely ruins you in the best possible way. Right, Because I saw that God was not just this nice Sunday religious tradition, but that he was real. And that he had the power to transform lives. And I knew I wanted to be part of something like that as well. And so I believe, and I'm so, the cry of my heart is that I don't just want to read or hear about stories of God's power. I don't want to just read about it in the Bible. I want to experience it in my life. I believe that every one of us has, God has given a mission to not just to survive, not just to live for ourselves, but to use the vapor of time that we have on this planet for eternal significance. Every one of us is called to that. And if there was ever a time or a generation that needs to experience God's power outside of the church, it's today. We live in a time where people are desperate and they need to know Jesus. So what will it take? What will it take to experience God's power outside the church. How can I carry that power outside the church? So this morning, I wanna look at Nehemiah, chapter one, verses one through four. I wanna look at that as an example of how we can experience God's power outside the church. So let me read that to you this morning. Nehemiah one, verses one through four. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. All right, so here's the context. Nehemiah, he's part of the Jewish exiles in the Persian Empire, right? And, and he actually, he's got a pretty good gig. He, he gets to be the cupbearer to the king, which is a pretty cool job, unless it's poison, in which case it's not so good. But either way, like he has a pretty good life, right? And what happens is, is he hears from some relatives that come visit him that Jerusalem is in trouble, that the walls are in ru ruined, and the city is vulnerable. And so the first thing we learn from this scripture is that like Nehemiah, we need God to open our eyes to the state of the world. 
I don't know about you, but it's so easy to be busy and distracted. I mean, in the busyness of our daily life, it's so easy to be unaware or numb to, to all the problems of the world. You know, in our country alone, for example, we've experienced a profound cultural shift. We've gone from this nominal Christian nation in which most identified as a Christian to a post-Christian nation. The, the fastest growing religious group in our country is the religiously unaffiliated, where now there are like 30 million added in the last decade alone. And it's, it's not just affiliation, it's attitude as well. So in the past, most people had a positive view with the church. They saw it, you know, as a good thing, and the Bible has, it was a moral a guide for your life. But today, especially amongst the younger generation, they often have, at best, an apathetic view of the church. They don't really care, if not outright hostile. And so we live in a, a very changing time, and that's a challenge for us as a church. How do we respond to that challenge? And a lot of this shift that we are experiencing in our culture is actually the product and influence of something called the global youth culture. And these are the people that God has called us as a mission to go after. Think young adults, 17 to 35 year olds all over the planet that are influenced by similar voices. They're playing the same video games, following the same social media influencers, generally more connected and similar than ever before. And they're similar on superficial things, right? Like music and fashion trends. But they're also similar on deeper things like morality and, and lifestyle and worldview. And it's this global generation. Now, let me illustrate this for you, for example. Take a look at this picture. And based on how they look and how they're dressed, can you guess where they're from? Now, let's just go, like, pick a continent, where do you think these guys, in your mind, where do you think they're from based on how they look and how they're dressed? Now, would it surprise you if I told you that they're from Lebanon, in the heart of the Middle East? I mean, these guys look like they could be at a coffee shop down the road, right? And so it totally illustrates this global culture that we're in. It's a global youth culture that is influenced by pop culture. They're influenced by internet stars on TikTok and YouTube, they're influenced by video games, which is massive. There was a study that came out that said the average 21-year-old male in our country has spent 10,000 hours playing video games, which, by the way, is the same amount of time that you need to master a fine art, right? So it's crazy the amount of time that we spend. It's where we find our community and our sense of accomplishment, and it's an incredibly influential thing. And then, of course, lastly, is pornography, which is so common, so pervasive, it's not even something to be ashamed of, right? That, and, and it's literally rewiring our, our brains and distorting our view on love and sexuality and relationships. And all of these things are coming together to influence a global culture. And the religion of this global youth culture is secular humanism. So secular humanism means this. God has been replaced and I am at the center and there's no outside authority that can tell me how to live my life. Like basically what I feel is true. That's my truth. And it's essentially a religion of self. And so this is the predominant mindset. And if you pay attention, you see this message everywhere. Here's a, here's a poster at a Starbucks. It says, don't you ever let a soul in the world tell you that you can't be exactly who you are. Quoting Lady de Gaga. Now, that is secular humanism, defined. And it's so appealing, it sounds so good, but the consequences are devastating. It's like poison wrapped in bubble gum. And, and so the, 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 real, the reality that we need to understand is the consequence of this mindset is heartbreaking. To give you an example, a while back, <clears throat> a non-Christian friend of mine from high school posted on social media that his son who happened to be about the same age as my oldest son, had been diagnosed with brain cancer. And when I saw that, man, my heart broke. I couldn't imagine the pain and the fear that he must have been going through. I couldn't imagine if my son had been diagnosed with brain cancer. And then I began to read some of the comments on his posts. 
And he was getting things like positive vibes, sending healing vibes his way, sending you all positive vibrations and much love. And then eventually he responded like this. He said, thank you, everyone, for the supportive words of concern and positive energy you have expressed for my son, Peter. And I couldn't help but think about how hopeless it sounded. You know, because in the secular humanistic worldview, there is no transcendent hope. Just positive vibrations. And this is, this is devastating. This is a generation that is devastated by loneliness, anxiety, depression. They're searching for an answer, but the sad thing is they're not walking into the church. And this isn't a distant thing. This isn't trends and statistics. These are our sons and daughters. These are our friends. These are people we work with. Our hearts should break when we hear this. Our response should be like that of Nehemiah in verse 4 when he said, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. You see, the extent to which our hearts are broken is the extent that we're going to do something about it. You know, when our hearts are broken, we're going to get uncomfortable. We're going to sacrifice. We're going to put aside our preferences and our needs in order to go after those that are far from God. We need our hearts broken. And this isn't something like, that you do like a workout program. Like, okay, starting on Monday, I'm going to have a broken heart. No, it's like the only thing we can do is repent and say, God, my heart is cold. I'm sorry, it's not right. Would you give me your heart? We need to ask God to awaken us from our apathy, to give us his heart, because we need to recognize the situation we're in and to realize that we are in a war, not against people, not against people. It's a, it's a war against spiritual forces in the heavenly realms as described in Ephesians 6. It's a battle for the souls of a generation that has been deceived. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God of this age has, been blinded by the mind, has, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. What that means is that this isn't just a matter of logic or persuasive argument. We're dealing with a generation that has been deceived spiritually. And so if I say, hey, take a look at that wall, but you're blind, you can't see it. And so we need, we need to pray and recognize that our answer, to our hope, is that we need God to move in a supernatural, spiritual way. That's why a persuasive argument or a really great program is never enough. So like Nehemiah, we need to pray like never before because we are in a spiritual battle. Nehemiah 1.4 goes on to say, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Some biblical scholars estimate that Nehemiah actually spent four months in intense prayer and fasting. Four months. So why, why would he do this? Why would he do it so long and with such intensity? I think that's because when, when God opened Nehemiah's eyes to the problem, he recognized that he couldn't fix it that he didn't have enough. And so like Nehemiah, we need to recognize that the mission that we are called to is not hard, it's impossible. That means that no human strategy, no financial resource will ever be enough. I can't even solve the problems of my own family. But I know that I serve the God of the impossible. And so it's not until we get on our knees in desperation and say, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on my family. Have mercy on our city and our country and this world until we get on our knees and say, I can't do it. I need you. That's where the breakthrough starts. And I don't know about you, but I look around and I need God to move. Our human efforts, our human wisdom, it's not enough. We need God's supernatural power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, 
but of power. That's our hope. And here's the amazing thing. God chooses to use ordinary people like me and like you to manifest his power in the world. That's an amazing thing, an amazing truth, which means that like Nehemiah, our broken heart for the lost and our desperate prayers should lead us to courageous action. If you come to the Steiger International Training Center in Germany, where we train our missionaries that go all over the world, on the wall you're going to see it written, Hebrews, it says, God rewards those who seek him with a desperate heart. And it's a paraphrase off of Hebrews 11.6. And so I read it to you now. It says, and without faith... It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So that's really interesting because there's a part of that, that verse that says anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And I think that's interesting because this was written to a Christian audience. And of course they believe that God exists. So what, what is being said here? And I think the reality is that it's easy to believe intellectually or conceptually that something is true. But the proof for what you believe is how it transforms your actions. How it impacts the way you live. That is the true indication of what I believe. So I'll give you an illustration of this. So I grew up in Amsterdam. We, live in, we lived in a small apartment at the top of an apartment complex right in the middle of the city. And we would have all sorts of interesting things that happened on the streets below. I remember one time there was a full-on riot that broke out between a group of soccer hooligan fans and drug dealers having a riot on the street below our apartment. I mean, you don't need TV when you got that kind of stuff going on on the streets below. And so we're watching this thing play out and they're like, picking up um, bottles and rocks and chucking at each other. Crazy, intense environment. <clears throat> and then in the middle of this situation, a police officer shows up. A single police officer gets out of the car and starts to run right into the middle of the riot. And all these tough men look at the police officer, look at each other, drop their weapons, and run down the street together being chased by this single police officer. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then at some point, the police officer kind of recognizes what he's doing. He goes, okay, and he kind of backs up and does one of these and gets in his car. But for a moment, that police officer so believed in the authority and the power of the one he represented that he was willing to run into a riot. That is what it means to believe that God exists. That you so believe in the authority and the power of the one you represent that you're willing to run anywhere he calls you to go. And when you do that, that's when you experience the supernatural. But man, to live this kind of life, it takes courage. And I love the idea of courage, here's why. Courage does not mean you're fearless. Courage means the courage is not the absence of fear, but rather a willingness to do the right thing despite the fear you feel. If you Google the definition of, of courage, it says the ability to do something that frightens you. I love that because everyone faces fear. It's totally normal to be afraid. Even the great apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 said, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. I mean, this is the apostle Paul. He did incredible things, miraculous things. And it says he is so afraid that he's trembling. And that's good news because that means that if you are afraid, you are in no way disqualified from being used by God. Following Jesus is about having the courage to step through those fears, and then to take risks, you know, because it's the risk of, you know, how is this going to play out financially? Is this going to hurt my reputation? Are people going to mock me? What am I going to face? It's willing to step through those fears and take a risk, because risk is intrinsic to faith. Where there's no risk, there is no faith. And where there's no faith, there is no power. We need to be willing to take Holy Spirit-led risks. 
I'll give you kind of a crazy example of this. Um, a number of years ago, I was part of a, a, a band in Steiger called No Longer Music, and we toured around the world and used the stage to proclaim the gospel, and we were doing a tour of the Middle East. And at one point, we were doing a tour specifically in Turkey. Now, Turkey is a country, it's, it's pretty tough, 99.9% Muslim. The people can be pretty tough sometimes um, when it comes to the gospel. And so we were doing a tour in different cities around the country, and we used the stage to proclaim the, the gospel message. And we arrived at one particular city, and when we got there, we realized that the concert we were doing that night was actually organized and hosted by the local city government, which is not normal for us. But we're like, all right. And we actually got a, a police escort into the center of town. So it kind of you know, felt kind of cool as we did that. And when we got into town, there was this big kind of festival atmosphere, all sorts of fun stuff going on, big stage. And on the stage was a banner with something written in Turkish. And so I asked our partner, I was like, what, is, what does this mean? And, and the, the partner looked at it and then kind of got a concerned look on their face. And they said, um... Well, it says, welcome to the Ramadan festival. And so it was the first night of Ramadan. This town was having a festival to celebrate, and we were the opening act. This is not normal, just so you know, right? And so we were a little concerned, like, what should we do? And, and so um, we started to have some conversation. The guy that organized the concert um, was the son of, a, of an imam who had come to Jesus and organized our tour, and he was feeling very concerned. It was like, well, maybe we shouldn't say the name Jesus, just God, because that'll be less offensive. And we were like, well, we don't want to be stupid, but what should we do? And so we decided to go and, and go for a prayer walk and just ask the Lord what we should do. And as we were praying and seeking the Lord, someone came up to us and said, I don't know if you heard this, but the city we're in right now, it's a half a million people, not a single church. And I remember feeling strong impression from the Lord saying, how else, if you don't tell them, how else will these people hear about me? And so we didn't know what the response would be because we'd had some crazy stuff happen in other places like knives pulled on us, rocks thrown. We didn't know what the reaction would be, but we knew that God had called us to proclaim the name of Jesus. And so we did our concert, and again, our concert is a very clear depiction of the message of the cross, and it, it finishes with the proclamation, proclamation that his name is Jesus. And I, I can tell you this, while we went through the concert, the fear never went away. I was so afraid, I felt sick to my stomach. But we went through our, we did our show, proclaimed the name of Jesus, and all I can tell you, instead of being booed or charged at or rocks on us, people cheered, and over 100 people signed up for the Bible correspondence course saying they wanted to follow Jesus. Yeah. At the Ramadan festival. And let me be clear, that had nothing to do with us. That was completely beyond anything we could take credit for. God did something supernatural, but it took taking a risk. Now, you might be listening to this story about Ramadan and all that and going, this is way too much for me. Like, I could never do that. And of course, not everyone is called to quit their job and join a rock band and tour the Middle East. Some of you may be, but not everyone, right? But every one of us is called to be a courageous, radical follower of Jesus right where he's placed you. Every one of us is called to live this out, whether you're in business, a teacher, a student, doesn't matter. Every one of us is called to live this radical, courageous life right where God has placed you. So where do we get this courage from? Acts 4.13 says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. The reason, the reason that Peter and John had courage was not because they were smarter, you know, or more skilled than others. It's because they had an intimate relationship with Jesus. Their confidence came from a deep trust in Jesus and not themselves. And see, here's the thing. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you press into him, the bigger he becomes and the smaller the world's obstacles become in comparison. And also courage is like a muscle because the more you say yes to Jesus, the more you take steps of faith, the stronger that muscle of courage gets. And it's more about a lifestyle of saying yes to Jesus, one yes after the other. 
If you build that lifestyle saying yes to Jesus, you continually do that. He builds that muscle of courage. You see him move in supernatural ways. And eventually, you find yourself in your own Ramadan festival. Where you see something so supernatural, you cannot take credit for it. That's the life that God has called you to live. So here's what I want you to take away from all this. Ask God to open your eyes to the state of the world, to really see. You know, for some of us, maybe we've even grown numb to those in our own family who don't know Jesus. Ask him to open our eyes afresh. And then to ask him to break our hearts for what breaks his. Ask him to, so that we will really see people through his eyes. And then recognize that the problems of this world are not hard, they're impossible. So pray like never before to the God of the impossible. And then when he speaks to you, and he will, when he speaks to you, have the courage to say yes. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much for your presence. Thank you that you are real and that you choose to use ordinary, imperfect people like us. Lord, I pray that for everyone in this room, you would give them a, a new perspective on the world, that you would open their eyes to truly see the state of our world and that you would break our heart for what breaks yours. Lord, we want your heart. We need to see the world through your eyes. And Lord, we, we can't do it. We don't have enough, but we trust that you can. And so Lord, our confidence is not in ourselves, it's in you. And Lord, whatever it is that you ask us to do, we will say yes. So Lord, I pray even in this very moment that you would begin to speak to everyone in this room, specifically and personally, how you want them to respond. And that they would have the courage to say yes and to see your supernatural work through their life. So Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray that it wouldn't just be a sudden or a short burst of emotion, but it would be something that goes deep within us. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that you saved us. And we pray that we bring that message to the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we close, I just wanted to let you know something I'm super excited about is we feel like God has called us to bring a Steiger City team to Sacramento. And um, yeah, and we are working in partnership and collaboration with Capital Christian and other churches in this city to build a team that's gonna go after young people that would not walk into a church.